Did you know that there are angels all around you, even if you haven't noticed them before? Many people go through their days unaware of the angelic presence surrounding them. In this video, I want to share five clear signs that angels are present in your life, whether you're a firm believer in their intervention or simply curious about these celestial beings. My hope is that by the end, you'll have a glimpse into the unseen realm of angels and start recognizing their subtle operations in your own life. This, in turn, will ignite your faith in the living God. Before we dive in, it's crucial to emphasize that as believers, our faith isn't built upon angels. Our faith is firmly rooted in the simple truth of what Christ has done for us. In other words, Christ's sacrifice is the true cornerstone of our faith, and that's the unwavering foundation we stand on. We lean on this confidence, not on angels. Additionally, while angelic activity can uplift and inspire us, it shouldn't be the defining feature of our Christian journey. Ultimately, our greatest desire is to strive to emulate Jesus' life and reflect His character in every aspect of our own, ultimately revealing Him to the world. Having made that clear, let me ask, who are angels? Do they really exist? And if they do, what's their assignment? Angels are spiritual beings created to worship and serve God, making them one of the most mysterious aspects of God's creation. Despite popular misconceptions, angels aren't departed souls from good people from the past. They're distinct entities in God's grand design. According to the Bible, angels were created by God solely to worship and serve Him with unwavering loyalty and obedience. The Bible clarifies they're a distinct creation dedicated to God's will. In fact, angels are mentioned a whopping 300 times in the Bible. Though mostly unseen, they can sometimes appear in human form. Remember, their very name, Angel, means messenger. This means that they're always out and about to carry out God's will. The big question remains, how can we tell if angels are around us? This question often lingers in the minds of believers. While many don't doubt the existence of angels, they're curious about how to recognize their presence, considering their spiritual nature. Will we see them with our physical eyes? Is there a sign that indicates their presence? Join me as I unravel five unmistakable signs that signify an angel's presence in your life. Sign number one, sudden outbursts of joy. Joy, as ordinary as it seems, is clear evidence of the presence of angels around us. Sometimes the presence of angels can bring about a sense of joy that seems to come out of nowhere. Have you ever been in a church service, lost in worship or prayer, feeling ordinary joy, when suddenly an unexplainable wave of happiness washed over you? It was like sunshine bursting in your heart. This type of joy often accompanies angels when God sends them to deliver good news. For instance, when the angel appeared to the shepherds in Luke 2, 10, he came with contagious supernatural joy. That's a hallmark of their presence. This is similar to Mary's encounter in Luke 1, 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Angels often announce their arrival with a warm wave of happiness. Sarah, visited by angels before Isaac's birth, named him Laughter due to the joy they brought. So the next time you're praying or worshiping and you feel an unusual burst of joy, pay attention. It might just be there's an angelic presence nearby. Remember, while joy is a fruit of the Spirit, this is something different, deeper, and inexplicably powerful. I recall a time back in university when a group of us were praying together. As we worshiped, we were overcome with joy and we even heard strange sounds around us. It was a mesmerizing experience, and we realized that angels were among us. We left that place still carrying that intense joy in our hearts, inspired and empowered. So if you ever find yourself feeling an intense, spontaneous joy during prayer or fellowship, take notice. It could be a clear sign of angelic activity. And that brings us to the next sign, Sign number two, uncommon strength. 
Another indication of angelic presence is a sudden surge of strength, especially during times of prayer and devotion. Have you ever started praying, feeling drained and weak, only to have an unexplainable surge of strength wash over you? It's like someone wraps you in a warm blanket of power, pushing back fatigue and allowing you to pray with renewed vigor. The Bible offers a glimpse of this experience in the life of Jesus. Luke 22:43 says that, as Jesus prayed, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Jesus, facing an overwhelming trial, received divine strength from the angel to endure what lay ahead. Just like God sent an angel to fortify Jesus, they can bring supernatural strength to you too. There are times when life's challenges leave us feeling weak and depleted. Yet as we turn to prayer, we find ourselves praying with remarkable clarity and power, almost as if something is guiding our words. This unexpected strength is often a sign that angels are present, lifting your spirit and offering support when you need it most. Remember, angels are powerful beings, and their presence can sometimes be felt through the surge of unexplainable strength we experience when they're near. This brings us to the next sign. Sign number three, physical sensation of warmth. Another sign that angels are present with you is the sensation of warmth, either around you or in specific parts of your body, while you pray, worship, or fellowship. Have you ever been praying or worshiping when a warmth engulfs you? Some believers report feeling a burning sensation on their feet or hands, while others sense warmth spreading throughout their entire body or a feeling of comforting warmth surrounding them. Isaiah 6, 6-7 describes an angel like this, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. This angel touched the prophet's lips with burning coal, cleansing him of sin. These particular angels are called seraphim and are associated with this burning sensation hinting at their connection to warmth. Furthermore, I want you to know that angels often accompany the Holy Spirit during prayer, worship, and fellowship. So when you experience an unexplained warmth, it might be angels joining you in praising God. Think of it as a warm welcome, a comforting presence acknowledging your devotion. Remember, this warmth isn't always intense, but rather soothing and unexpected. It's a subtle sign that angels might be close, sharing your moments of spiritual connection. Sign number four, glimpses of light. The radiant brilliance of God's angels often surpasses what our natural eyes can fully comprehend. However, there are moments when we catch glimpses of their dazzling light. During deep prayer, you might notice subtle lights appearing, even with your eyes closed. These lights could be flickers or flashes. Think back to Matthew 28, 2-4, where an angel descended with a dazzling brightness, like lightning against a backdrop of white snow. The passage reads, There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Many times in scripture, angels are associated with this otherworldly luminosity. So if you ever experienced unexpected light during prayer, especially with your eyes closed, it might be angels joining you in your communion with God. Consider it a reminder of their radiant presence and take advantage of these moments to deepen your connection with the Lord and now, on to the final sign. Sign number five, physical manifestation. Sometimes, when God wants to communicate through his angels, they may step outside their spiritual realm and appear as humans. Angels have been known to take on the guise of ordinary individuals. The Bible even advises us to show kindness to strangers, as some may unknowingly be angels in disguise. Hebrews 13.2 reminds us, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Remember Abraham from Genesis 18? 
He welcomed angels who looked like ordinary men, offering them food and rest. Similarly, Manoah and his wife encountered an angel in human form in Judges 13, receiving guidance from God about their future son, Samson. Judges 13, 6-7 says, Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You'll become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Since angels are spiritual beings, they can manifest in visible, audible, or tangible forms when sent by God. However, while angels can appear to us, it's not something we can pray, fast, or study for. God reveals His angels at His own discretion, not ours. Our focus should remain on building a strong relationship with God. And if He chooses to send an angelic messenger in human form, it'll be a powerful confirmation and blessing. In conclusion, when you notice angelic activities in your life, don't let fear take over. Instead, embrace their presence to pray, listen for their messages, and worship the Lord with sincerity. As mentioned earlier, angelic activity is amazing, but we're not called to focus on it. The Bible doesn't instruct us to pray, fast, or put faith in them. Our goal as Christians should always be to reflect Jesus Christ in every aspect of our lives. Moreover, it's crucial to let God's Word be our guide, even in moments of sensing an angelic presence. If someone you perceive as an angel demands otherwise, be cautious, as it could be a demonic trick. Remember, even Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. True angels of God will never demand worship or reverence. Instead, they'll always point us to worship the one true God who deserves all our praise. When Jesus bid farewell to his disciples following his resurrection, he pledged to intercede with God to send them a comforter in the form of the Holy Spirit, a promise fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Yet this promise extends far beyond the disciples alone. Every child of God is entitled to this divine blessing. Certainly, possessing the Holy Spirit imbues a Christian with blessings beyond measure, transcending mere fluency in tongues. Remember the remarkable transformation, power, wisdom, and confidence that enveloped the disciples upon receiving the Spirit? Regrettably, many contemporary Christians remain distant from such experiences mistakenly equating the ability to speak in tongues with genuine spiritual transformation. As 2 Timothy 3 aptly states, many exhibit a form of godliness while lacking its true power. In these times, with various spirits at play, discerning the genuine presence of the Holy Spirit becomes paramount. Just as the Bible warns that the devil can masquerade as an angel of light, many within the church today may unknowingly operate under a counterfeit spirit Distinguishing those genuinely filled with the Holy Spirit requires no prolonged fasting or fervent prayer. Throughout history, a consistent pattern emerges in the lives of those truly infused with the Spirit of God, a set of distinct habits that serve as hallmarks of their spiritual journey. Before we proceed further, I urge you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and commit to watching till the end. This message carries profound significance that stands to transform your spiritual walk. So what are these habits that characterize a person genuinely filled with the Holy Spirit? Let's explore the transformative practices that define those in tune with the divine. Number one, the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is unmistakable. It's like a secret ingredient that transforms you from the inside out. You see, when the Holy Spirit dwells within you, something remarkable happens. You start bearing fruits, not just any fruits, but the kind that reflect the very nature of God Himself. It's like a spiritual makeover, guided by Galatians 5, 22-23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things, there is no law. Which lays out the blueprint, love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These aren't just fancy words. They're the building blocks of a life lived in harmony with God's will. Take love, for example. When the Holy Spirit takes residence in your heart, love becomes your default mode. It's not just a fleeting emotion. It's a way of life. You start seeing people through God's eyes with compassion and empathy, regardless of who they are or what they believe. Your love isn't selective. It's all-encompassing, reaching out to everyone in need. And as you walk in love, you become a beacon of hope in a world filled with darkness. Then there's faith, the kind that moves mountains. It's not about wishful thinking. It's about trusting in God's promises, even when everything around you screams doubt. With the Holy Spirit as your guide, you can weather any storm with unwavering confidence, knowing that God is in control. This faith isn't blind. It's rooted in the unshakable truth of God's Word. And let's not forget about peace and joy. In a world plagued by chaos and uncertainty, the peace that surpasses all understanding becomes your constant companion. It's a peace that anchors your soul, regardless of the storms raging around you. And with peace comes joy, not the fleeting kind that depends on circumstances, but the deep, abiding joy that comes from knowing Christ. If you're not experiencing these fruits in your life, maybe it's time to reevaluate your relationship with God. You see, the Holy Spirit isn't just a distant presence. He's a constant companion, waiting to be invited into every area of your life. And the key to unlocking His power? Prayer. It's not just a religious ritual. It's a lifeline. A line of direct communication with the Creator of the universe. Number two. A burning hunger for God's Word and His presence, paired with constant prayer, is non-negotiable. It's impossible to claim fellowship with the Holy Spirit if you can't recall the last heartfelt conversation you had with Him. And let me caution you, if someone professes to possess the Holy Spirit but lacks a steady commitment to studying God's Word and prayer, exercise caution. When the Holy Spirit dwells within you, He ignites a passion to dive deep into Scripture. Remember when Jesus spoke to his disciples about the Holy Spirit? He promised that the Spirit would be their teacher in all things. This means the Holy Spirit enriches your understanding of God's Word. He unveils profound truths hidden within the Scriptures, enriching your knowledge of God's Word with each passing day. Moreover, the Holy Spirit bolsters your prayer life, reminding you of the vital importance of communion with God. In Romans 8, 26, the Apostle Paul affirms this truth, stating, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Holy Spirit grants you sensitivity to God's leading, guiding you to seek wisdom and understanding through fervent prayer. The Word of God isn't just a religious obligation for those attuned to the Holy Spirit. It's their lifeline to divine wisdom and guidance. Through diligent study and meditation on God's Word, they gain insights that illuminate their path, equipping them to navigate life's complexities with grace and discernment. Number 3. Acts of Compassion When the Holy Spirit resides within someone, it's like a light shining through their actions. You see, they naturally tend towards compassion, kindness, and selflessness. It's not forced or contrived. It flows from them effortlessly. Think about it. Extending a helping hand, lending a listening ear. These aren't just gestures. They're reflections of divine love and motion. Their deeds, fueled by this love, carry a power that transforms lives, infusing hope into a world that's craving genuine connections. It's like they're walking embodiments of God's love, leaving a trail of positivity and kindness wherever they go. And that, my friends, is the mark of someone who's truly touched by the Holy Spirit. They don't just talk the talk, they walk it, radiating love and compassion without even realizing it. That's the kind of presence that leaves an imprint on hearts and souls, a presence that speaks volumes. Number four, triumph over sin. Living in sin ensnares a person, binding them in chains of bondage. The Apostle Paul, sharing wisdom in the Bible, 
emphasizes that whatever holds sway over you controls you. It robs you of what truly matters. Paul further explains that obedience dictates your allegiance, whether to sin or righteousness. This is a defining characteristic of those filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers believers to conquer the grips of sin, enabling them to withstand temptation and the world's seductions. Without this empowerment, one becomes vulnerable to the wiles of the devil. Those infused with the Holy Spirit possess a heightened sensitivity to righteousness, nurturing a deep desire to walk in God's ways and honor His commands. They discern the abundance of blessings, fostering a spirit of gratitude amidst all circumstances. Even amidst trials, they find cause for joy, recognizing that each experience is an avenue for growth and divine intervention. Number 4. Victory Over Sin You know living in sin is like being trapped. The great Apostle Paul, he talked about this in the Bible. He said, whatever holds you, whatever grips you, it becomes your master. And let me tell you, it steals away the things that truly matter. He went on to say, what you obey, that's your master, whether it's sin or doing what's right. See, here's the thing that sets someone with the Holy Spirit apart from someone who's just empty inside. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to conquer sin. You can boldly say, I'm not a slave to sin anymore. But that's because the Holy Spirit helps you to say no to temptation, to turn away from all the flashy empty promises this world offers. Otherwise, you're just prey to the devil's schemes. People filled with the Holy Spirit can sense what's right, and they have this deep desire to walk hand in hand with God, to follow His lead. They see the blessings all around them, even in tough times, and they're grateful for every bit of it. They find joy even in the midst of struggles, because they know that every experience, good or bad, is a chance to grow, to experience something divine. So let me tell you, Having the Holy Spirit, it's not just some idea. It's a game changer, a life transformer. It's the difference between being stuck in the same old cycle of sin and stepping into a life of freedom and purpose. Let's talk about the fifth habit, having the boldness to share the message of peace. Picture this, Peter, once timid and fearful, now stands tall among his peers, fearlessly proclaiming the truth. Remember that pivotal moment on Pentecost? The Holy Spirit descended, transforming not just their hearts, but their very words. It's like a light switched on inside them, illuminating mysteries previously hidden. Jesus himself said they'd spread his message far and wide, and that's exactly what they did. Peter, who once had faltered in fear, now leads with courage. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, empowering ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Ephesians 1 7 says he or she has been redeemed or their sins were forgiven. Ephesians 1 13 tells us that new believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1 13. Moving on to faith, the cornerstone of our journey, it's about trusting in something bigger than ourselves, even when the road ahead seems uncertain. Those led by the Spirit walk in faith, witnessing miracles unfold as prayers are answered and obstacles crumble. Their lives become living proof of God's power at work. Now, let's talk humility, a virtue often overlooked in today's world of self-promotion. But those filled with the Holy Spirit understand the true essence of greatness. It's not about chasing fame or fortune. It's about serving others with humility and obedience. They relinquish their own desires, allowing the Spirit to guide them towards righteousness and selflessness. Boldness, faith, and humility. Three key habits of those walking with the Holy Spirit. It's not about flashy words or grand gestures. It's about living with purpose and conviction, letting the Spirit lead the way. Number six. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it's like being equipped with superpowers. But instead of saving the world, these gifts empower you to serve God and help others find their way to Him. The Bible puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, 4-7. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. 
for the common good. So, whether it's the gift of prophecy, healing, teaching, or discernment, these abilities aren't just for show. They're meant to be put into action, to make a real difference in the lives of those around you. But remember, they're not for your own glory. They're for lifting up the body of Christ and showing the world the greatness of God. So let's keep the Holy Spirit active in our lives, not just for our sake, but for the sake of everyone around us. Now, I want to hear from you. What's one way you've seen the Holy Spirit at work in your life or in the lives of others? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more insights like this. What does it mean to be a godly person? How can you tell if you are living a life that pleases God and reflects His character? Many people have different opinions and standards about what constitutes a godly person. But the Bible gives us clear characteristics of what God expects and desires from His children. In this video, we will discuss three signs of a godly person that may surprise you. These signs are not based on outward appearance, religious rituals, or human achievements, but on the inner transformation and spiritual growth that God works in us through His grace and power. These signs are not meant to be a checklist or a formula for becoming a godly person, but rather a guide and a goal for our spiritual journey. They are also not meant to be a source of pride or comparison, but rather a reminder of our dependence on God and our need for His grace. Being a godly person is not something we can achieve on our own. It is something we can receive and grow in as we surrender to God and follow His guidance. Let's explore each of these signs in more detail and see how they can help us become more like Christ. Before we go further, please take a moment to like this video and share it with someone who needs to hear this message. Your support helps us to reach more people, spread the gospel of Jesus, and change more lives. Now, here are three signs that you are a godly person. Number one, you place Christ first and prioritize your relationship with Him above all else. What does this mean? The first important characteristic of a godly person is the life of Christ in you. Through Jesus, God gave us the priceless privilege of sharing in His Godhead. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9-10, through 10, in the Amplified Translation, carefully assures us, For in Him the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. And you are in Him, made full and having come to fullness of life in Christ. You too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. And He is the head of all rule and authority for every angelic principality and power. What these verses are saying is no different from what Jesus taught in John chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into a fire and burned. Through our connection to Jesus, we share the divine life, the God kind of life. This life is called the Zoe life. It is the very life of God that constitutes His divine nature. A godly person is one who has received this life through faith in Jesus and highly esteems this life. The godly person knows that this life is not the result of their work or efforts. They know it is the result of faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Therefore, they cherish this life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. A godly person is identified, not just by the fact that they have this life, but that they cherish it above all else. They know that this life is in their own. They know that their body is God's temple now. They know that they were bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Therefore, they commit to live for Christ's sake. When you place Christ Jesus above religion, above public opinion, and above your own pleasures in life, this is a sign that you are a godly person. At every chance you get, you make sure to put the Word of God, the glory of God, the will of God first, before anything else. Yes, there may be worldly distractions and struggles of the flesh, 
However, a sign of godliness is that you desire to please God above all else, to share your faith with the lost, and to live above the cares of this world. Number two, focus on eternal things, not worldly things. Another authentic sign of godliness is a genuine and strong focus on Jesus and things that carry eternal value. A godly person's focus, much like a lighthouse's unwavering beam cutting through the darkest night, remains firmly fixed on Jesus and the eternal treasures that lie beyond the reach of time. As Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 reveals, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is about carrying a perspective that transcends the mundane and fleeting desires of the world, revealing a higher purpose. Consider the story of John, a man who once found himself entrapped in the web of materialism. His life revolved around accumulating wealth, seeking pleasure, and pursuing worldly success. The more he chased these transient dreams, the emptier he felt. The allure of the world had blinded him to the eternal beauty and grace of a life centered on Christ in eternity. One day, John had a revelation. He likened his pursuit of worldly pleasures to chasing mirages, those elusive oases that seemed promising from afar but turned out to be illusions. He realized that the world's pleasures were temporary, leaving him perpetually dissatisfied. It was as if he had been chasing after shadows that faded with the dawn. In this moment of clarity, John decided to recalibrate his gaze. He turned his attention to Jesus, the unchanging and eternal source of true fulfillment. As he deepened his relationship with God, he found solace in the knowledge that his soul held immeasurable value. This shift in perspective was like a sunrise breaking through the storm clouds, revealing the promise of a new day. John now understood that life was a brief sojourn, a mere prologue to the eternal story that awaited him. With Jesus as his guiding light, he embarked on a spiritual journey, prioritizing his relationship with God over the allure of fleeting pleasures. As he sought to store up treasures in heaven, his life became a testament to the wisdom of a godly person. The allure of material wealth and transient joys lost their grip on him. John's heart and soul were captivated by the eternal, and he lived with a profound awareness of the value of his soul, recognizing that it was far more precious than any temporary indulgence the world could offer. In essence, John's story serves as a vivid illustration of a godly person's shift in focus from the ephemeral to the eternal, understanding that their soul's worth surpasses the world's fleeting charms. A godly person focuses on reaching heaven at the end of their journey and will therefore do everything it takes, including denying themselves some worldly pleasures to achieve this goal. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is where a godly person finds their worth. And remember, godliness plus contentment is great gain. Number three, you produce the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Another profound sign that you are a godly person is that you exhibit the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The fruits of a godly person's life, much like a bountiful garden nurtured by a skilled gardener, are a testament to the ongoing transformation and sanctification by the Holy Spirit. It's a process like the refining of gold, gradually purifying the soul into a more Christ-like image. In other words, it is an indicator that something divine is happening to you on the inside, and everyone around you can see that this is beyond you. Let's look at the story of Peter, a fisherman turned disciple whose journey exemplifies this transformative process. In his early days, Peter was impulsive, often acting on instinct rather than faith. He resembled the rough stone, unrefined and unpolished, but with immense potential a potential only Jesus could see. 
One pivotal moment in Peter's life was his denial of Jesus, not once, but three times, as Jesus had foretold. It was a moment of profound weakness, much like a crack in a vase that threatens to shatter it. Yet in the aftermath of his denial, Peter experienced the transformative power of God's grace. He witnessed Jesus' resurrection and felt the overwhelming forgiveness and restoration offered by the Savior. Peter's transformation began to shine brightly. He went on to become one of the most influential apostles, playing a vital role in the early Christian church. His life bore the fruits of the Spirit. But here is what I want you to notice about the life of Peter. This transformation was not instantaneous. It required ongoing growth and discipline. Peter learned to temper his impulsiveness with patience and his fear with courage. He grew in faith, becoming a rock on which the early church could be built. He had received the Spirit of Christ at Pentecost and had learned to surrender to the inner workings of that Spirit. As the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. God was indeed working out in Peter what Peter couldn't work out in himself. Beloved, the process of sanctification, symbolized by a potter molding clay into a beautiful vessel, is a journey of continuous refinement. Just as gold is purified in the furnace, a godly person experiences the refining fire of life's trials, which burn away impurities and leave behind a character that mirrors Christ. Being a godly person involves a daily commitment to grow and transformation. Through discipline, perseverance, and unwavering faith, they allow the Holy Spirit to mold them into vessels of honor, bearing the fruit that brings glory to God and blessings to those around them. The sanctification journey is a testament to the power of God's grace, constantly shaping and transforming lives into a reflection of Christ's character. Let me leave you with this note, friends. Being a godly person is a challenging but deeply rewarding journey. As we allow the Holy Spirit to work within us, we start to bear good fruits that honor God and benefit those near us. Let's keep moving forward in our path of sanctification, trusting that the same God who initiated this transformation in us will see it through until the day Christ Jesus arrives. We pray that our gracious Father will shine His light into our hearts and illuminate us wholly. May the Lord turn our hearts to Christ in love and reverence. May we have eyes that are fixed on Jesus and hearts that are focused on eternal things. We pray that the Lord will separate us from everything, seeking to distract us from our eternal journey. We break the hold of materialism and addictions, seeking to destroy us. May our love and knowledge of the Lord continue to grow more and more until that perfect day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To anchor yourself in this divine outpouring, leave an amen in the comments, uniting your faith with the blessings shared here. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new about what it means to be a godly person. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos. Dreams have captivated humanity's imagination for millennia, serving as portals to the subconscious and conduits for divine messages. Throughout history, dreams have been revered as a means of communication, often surpassing other forms of revelation, such as visions or direct encounters with the divine. Today, we delve into the enigmatic realm of dreams, particularly those that signify a calling from the Almighty. Number 1. The Significance of Receiving a Bible in Your Dreams Encountering a Bible in one's dreams may initially appear mundane, yet its symbolism carries profound implications. Let's unravel the mystery behind this divine encounter. It's not uncommon for individuals, irrespective of their religious affiliation, to witness the presence of a Bible in their dreamscapes. Such dreams are not merely happenstance, but rather laden with significance. Pause and ponder, for a dream of the Bible is not to be dismissed lightly. Too often, we neglect wisdom imparted in our dreams, oblivious to the celestial messages they bear. Whether you're a devout believer or a skeptic, heed the call embedded within this dream. If the pages of the Bible unfurl in your dreamscape, take heed 
for it symbolizes a sacred trust bestowed upon you by the divine. This is no mere coincidence. It's a divine summons to proclaim the gospel, to herald the good news to the ends of the earth. Your dreams are a tapestry woven by the hands of fate, threads of destiny intertwining to shape your purpose. Embrace the solemnity of this calling, for it's a mantle of responsibility bestowed upon the chosen few. As Romans 10.15 proclaims, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news! Let these words resonate with you, for they echo the divine decree written in the stars. In the Gospel of John 6.63, we're reminded, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The Bible transcends the realm of mortal existence. It's the living word pulsating with divine energy. Let us not reduce the Bible to mere ink on parchment. It's the very essence of God's revelation to humanity. Hebrews 4.12 paints a vivid picture, likening the Word of God to a double-edged sword, piercing through the veil of ignorance and illuminating the path to salvation. The Bible serves as a mirror, reflecting the ineffable glory of the Almighty. Within its sacred pages, we glimpse the majesty of God's character, His unwavering love and boundless grace. Jeremiah 23.29 declares, Is not my words like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Indeed, the Word of God is a consuming fire, igniting the flames of faith within our hearts. Let us heed the call of our dreams, for they are whispers from the divine guiding us along the path of righteousness. Embrace the sacred trust entrusted to you, for you are destined for greatness. As the pages of your destiny unfold, may you walk in the footsteps of the chosen ones, for you are truly untouchable in the eyes of God. Number 2. Spreading the Message Preaching Mark 16, 15-16 Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Ever had a dream where you found yourself preaching? It's natural to have questions when such a vivid experience occurs. Dreaming about preaching or sharing the gospel could signify a divine calling. Perhaps it's God nudging you to become a vessel for His message, reaching out to others in unique ways. If preaching fills your dreams, take heed it might be a sign that you're being called into a ministry. While some may doubt dreams as a medium of divine communication, preaching dreams more often than not carry a sense of purpose and inspiration. So what does it mean to dream of preaching? Well, it's not necessarily a prompt to grab a pulpit immediately. Rather, it's a gentle nudge from the divine to prepare yourself for a greater purpose. Sharing the Word of God isn't just a duty, but a privilege bestowed upon every believer. It's like being in love. You can't help but talk about the one who captured your heart. Matthew 28, 18-20 All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus' words echo through time urging us to spread his message. It's not about grand gestures, but everyday conversations infused with faith. The Great Commission isn't a task for a select few, but a calling for all who bear his name. So what could your preaching dream symbolize? A divine prompting to speak about God, a growing passion to share the gospel, a stirring within to answer a higher calling, a realization of your calling to be a preacher, a commission from God to spread His Word and save souls. While some dreams may be immediate instructions, others could be visions of what's to come. Regardless, each dream holds a piece of the divine puzzle, guiding you towards your purpose. Number 3. Angels Let's talk about angels. According to the book of Hebrews, God sends ministering spirits to those who are heirs of salvation. So if you find yourself encountering angels in your dreams, it's not just a coincidence. It's a divine encounter. It's like a direct line to the heavenly realm, where messengers are sent with messages tailored just for you. 
And guess what? The word angel literally means messenger. So you better believe there's something important they're trying to tell you. Now, here's the deal. When you receive a message in a dream, it's crucial to make sure it lines up with what's already written in the good book. We don't want any confusion, do we? Remember, even the devil can dress up as an angel of light. But if the message vibes with God's promises, then you know it's legit. But what if an angel shows up in your dream and doesn't say a word? That's where things get interesting. It could mean a bunch of different things depending on who you ask. Some say it's a sign of divine presence and guidance, like having a guardian angel watching your back. Others believe it's your subconscious trying to tell you something, like a gut feeling or a hunch. And then there's the whole mysterious vibe. Picture this, a silent angel appearing in your dream, filling you with awe and wonder. It's like a sacred moment, leaving you speechless and wanting more. Maybe it's a reminder of the good stuff inside you, like compassion, purity, and protection. You know, all the qualities angels are famous for. But here's the kicker. Dreams aren't just random movies playing in your head while you sleep. They're a window into your soul, a glimpse into your deepest desires and fears. So when a silent angel pays you a visit, it could be a wake-up call, a nudge to dig deeper, to explore your spiritual side, to find the answers you've been searching for. So, next time you catch yourself dreaming of angels, pay attention. There's a message in there somewhere, just waiting for you to decode it. And who knows, it might just change your life. Number 4. Anointing Oil Anointing oil, it's like a divine calling beckoning you to serve God. This isn't about making your own oil or seeking someone to anoint you. It's a sign that God has noticed you and has a special purpose in mind for you. It's as if he's saying, I have something for you, but you need to take the first step. Seek me wholeheartedly and I'll reveal it to you. Dreaming of being anointed by a man of God or a pastor? That's God pouring his anointing upon you, preparing you for something extraordinary. Just like in Psalm 133 too, where it speaks of oil flowing down Aaron's beard. It symbolizes God's empowerment for a significant task. Trust in His plan. He's equipping you with His anointing to accomplish remarkable things. It's the Holy Spirit guiding you towards a gift of ministry or revelation, something aligned with God's purpose for you. You're chosen for a royal task like the kings and priests of old. Your ministry is to spread His gospel heal the sick, and set the captives free, just as Jesus did, Luke 4, 18. Stay faithful to this calling, lest you lose the anointing bestowed upon you. Number 5. Preacher or Mentor If you find yourself repeatedly dreaming about receiving guidance from a religious figure, it might signal that you're being prepared for a special purpose by a higher power. In Acts 2, verse 17, it's stated, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Pay close attention to the identity of the religious figure in your dream. If it resembles someone you know who serves in a spiritual capacity, it could be a message that you're meant to learn from or be mentored by them. Take heed of their teachings, as they may hold specific messages tailored for you. Moreover, recurring dreams featuring a particular religious figure may indicate a divine calling for you to serve in a similar capacity. For instance, if you're frequently visited by dreams of a minister known for their healing ministry, it could be a sign that you're being called to pursue a healing ministry yourself. Similarly, if the dreams involve a preacher known for their evangelism, it might signify a calling for you to evangelize as well. Some individuals within the Christian community interpret dreams about pastors or religious figures as inherently positive. They view such dreams as blessings and affirmations of their faith and their connection to their spiritual leaders. However, it's crucial to exercise discernment when interpreting these dreams. The Bible warns us about the possibility of deception, with the devil masquerading as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11.14. For even Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Therefore, dreams featuring religious figures should prompt careful reflection and spiritual discernment 
While some dreams may affirm the authenticity of certain spiritual leaders, others may serve as cautionary messages, urging the dreamer to be wary of deceptive influences. Matthew 24, 11. Many individuals report dreams involving encounters with unfamiliar religious figures, such as receiving blessings or witnessing miracles. These experiences, while significant, should not overshadow the importance of discerning the source and meaning behind such dreams. It's essential to seek guidance from God and exercise spiritual discernment, rather than solely relying on dream interpretations or seeking validation from religious leaders. In conclusion, while dreams involving religious figures can hold profound significance and serve as sources of spiritual guidance, it's essential to approach them with discernment and seek confirmation from God rather than hastily seeking validation or guidance from religious leaders based on dreams alone. It's crucial to prioritize spiritual discernment and seek guidance from God. Remember, true spiritual guidance comes from God Himself, and He alone can lead us on the path of truth and righteousness. In a world where sharing every bit of our lives on social platforms has become the norm, there lies a profound wisdom and restraint in holding back especially when it concerns the blessings bestowed upon us by the divine. Our life is a beautiful tapestry of divine interventions and human endeavors. Each blessing we receive is a testament to God's unyielding love and mercy. Yet, the essence of cherishing these blessings often lies in the quiet acknowledgement rather than the loud proclamation. There's an unspoken sanctity in keeping our blessings close to our heart allowing them to nurture our soul, fuel our faith, and guide our actions. The scriptures provide a resolute foundation for this wisdom. A glance at Proverbs 21:23 reveals, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. It is not merely the act of speaking, but the consciousness of what, when, and how to share. Every uttered word carries an energy Every shared blessing holds a vibration. In preserving the sanctity of our blessings, we maintain a sacred bond with the divine, a bond untainted by the ephemeral applause of the fleeting validations of the world. Similarly, Proverbs 13.3 enlightens us, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. The verity of these words transcends time and resonates with our existence, even in the digital age. In a realm where the rush to share is fueled by a myriad of emotions and the race for recognition, the act of restraint is a journey back to humility, a path leading to a deeper connection with God. The culture of instantaneous sharing, of flaunting blessings under the guise of sharing joy, often steers us away from the essence of gratitude. The more we share, the more we subconsciously seek validation, drifting away from the purity of divine grace. In guarding our blessings, we foster a space of genuine gratitude, a realm where our bond with God blossoms in silence, and our hearts resonate with the hymns of thankfulness. In practicing restraint, we aren't merely following a biblical teaching, but embarking on a voyage of self-discovery and spiritual growth. We learn to distinguish between the joy derived from worldly validations and the serene happiness that blossoms in the garden of gratitude, watered by the silent acknowledgement of God's blessings. In Psalm 23, 5, we find a comforting assurance. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Here, the divine promise is dual. Not only will you be blessed, but your blessings will be visible to those who wish otherwise. Yet, there lies a subtle undercurrent of caution in this assurance. You see, the proximity of enemies in this verse isn't incidental. It's a profound reminder that those who harbor ill will may share your table, basking in the warmth of your trust. This biblical imagery isn't mere poetic allure, but a life lesson nestled in divine verses. Now, reflect on those moments when a new dawn of success was on your horizon. A thrill of sharing your joy is a natural impulse. 
but today's world often masks envy in the guise of camaraderie. The moment you unveil your blessings, the unseen battle against negativities begins. It's not a matter of distrust, but a path of wisdom that suggests a prudent silence. The tale of Joseph and his brothers is an evocative illustration of this principle. Joseph, blessed with divine visions, shared his dreams with a heart full of innocence. Yet, it spiraled into a saga of envy, betrayal, and separation. It's not a call to build walls around your heart, but to tread with discerning steps on who you unveil God's blessings to. As your blessings multiply, let your heart swell with gratitude. Let your prayers echo with thanks, but let your words be few. The essence of today's reflection is simple yet profound. When God blesses you, keep your mouth shut. The beauty of silence is that it's a canvas where God continues to paint your life's journey, uninterrupted by the strokes of negativity. And as He paints, let your life, not your words, showcase the masterpiece that is God's blessings. Let's bask in this divine wisdom, cherishing our blessings in the sacred silence, nurturing them with prayers, before they are sturdy enough to withstand the storms of envy and negativity. In this way, our blessings become not just a testimony to God's favor, but a beacon of His divine wisdom. Reflect upon the tale of Joseph, a young man adorned with dreams from above. His heart was a garden of love for his brothers. Yet naivete painted his words, unveiling the dreams that God bestowed upon him. His words, though innocent, were seeds planted in the soil of envy and malice among his brethren. The ripple effect of his utterances pushed him into a pit, yet God's promise carried him to Pharaoh's palace. Through the lens of hindsight, we see a young dreamer's journey prolonged by the premature disclosure of God's promise. Similarly, the narrative of Hezekiah unravels a tale of healing, a narrative of God's mercy intertwined with the human tendency to bask in the glory of blessings. Hezekiah, after being healed, could not tether his joy to the realm of silence. His words flew on the wings of pride, landing him in the field of regret. The book of Proverbs imparts a timeless wisdom. It tells us, even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent, discerning when he seals his lips. Proverbs 17, 28. This ancient adage holds within it a mirror, reflecting the power of a guarded tongue, especially when God's blessings are bestowed upon us. There's a rhythm of wisdom that beats in the heart of a believer, a rhythm that echoes the essence of modesty and gratitude. When the rain of blessings pours down, it's tempting to dance in the puddles of pride, to sing the songs of self-glory. Yet, the scriptural wisdom urges, in the dance of life, let your steps be guided by humility, let your words be few. In the arena of blessings, Silence is not an emblem of weakness, but a fortress of wisdom. It's a humble acknowledgement that every good and perfect gift is from above. It's an understanding that the blessings we carry are not medals of our might, but the testimony of God's mercy. Let's stroll through the pages of the Bible to the days of King Hezekiah, who ruled with a heart aligned to God's own. The sun of God's blessings shone brightly upon him, casting a radiant glow that attracted many, near and far. But there came a day when envoys from Babylon were drawn to this radiant glow, and King Hezekiah, in a moment of unchecked exuberance, showed them all the treasures that were entrusted to him by the divine. Later, these very envoys, masked in friendship, carried the news of the treasures back to their land, setting a stage for a future conquest. Now, let's reflect upon this. Blessings are like the morning sun that gently caresses the dew-kissed flowers. They are meant to be felt, cherished, and silently acknowledged. 
While it's a beautiful virtue to share and celebrate blessings, it's the wisdom of discernment that teaches us the when and the how. Every shared blessing carries with it an unseen ripple, and not all waters it touches are still. Proverbs 10.19 elucidates, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. The essence is to harbor a gentle restraint, a mindful pause before we unveil the tapestry of blessings. It's about cherishing the sanctity of divine gifts, about understanding the fine line between inspiring others and unknowingly inviting envy or malintent. Joseph's story is another profound biblical reflection. His dreams were a divine whisper, a glimpse of the grand design God had for him. But the premature sharing of these dreams with his brothers sowed seeds of envy and hatred that led to a pit, literally. However, God's plan still triumphed, but the journey carried with it trials that stemmed from words spoken without discernment. As we stand under the gentle shower of blessings, let's cultivate a garden of gratitude within. Let's learn the art of silent joy. Let's share, but with discernment. Let's celebrate, but with a heart of wisdom. As we navigate through the celebration of blessings, let's hold tight to the helm of discernment, steering through the waves with a spirit of humility and gratitude. This journey of cherishing blessings silently is not about fostering fear, but nurturing wisdom. Not about withholding joy, but sharing it in a manner that resonates with the divine counsel. It's about walking that fine line where our joy becomes a quiet testimony of God's grace, a silent sermon that speaks volumes, louder than any words could. Proverbs 10:19. When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. This is not merely a call towards physical silence, but a nudge towards spiritual maturity, understanding that every open ear may not harbor good intentions. There's a certain kind of serenity and strength discovered in silence, a place where the Holy Spirit brews deep and eternal works within us. It's in this silence that convictions are formed, that sorrow finds its place, and higher questions are pondered upon. Now, let's steer towards a tad deeper water, exploring the realm of discernment, as echoed in Revelation 12:11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony. Indeed, there's a time to share our testimony, but discernment is the rudder that navigates us through the waters of when and with whom to share. Not everyone clapping for you cherishes your progress. Some, veiled in the facade of friendship, harbor envy and ill wishes. They masquerade in sheep's clothing, yet in the shadows they plot. The essence of wisdom and discernment in recognizing such individuals cannot be overstated. It's not about fostering paranoia, but about nurturing prudence. Exercising restraint in sharing God's workings in your life isn't a sign of ungratefulness, but a mark of maturity. It's about understanding that not every ear is ripe for your testimony. 2 Corinthians 6.14 clearly articulates do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? It's a gentle reminder that the sanctity of your blessings is too precious to be scattered amongst those unable to value them. In the garden of your blessings, discretion is the fence that guards against the weeds of envy and malice. The world we sojourn in is a tapestry of varied hearts some rejoicing in your light, while others waiting to snuff it out. It's a realm where every joy shared is not always a joy multiplied. But fear not, for as you walk in discernment, guarding the blessings sown in your life, you allow the divine plans to mature, to blossom under the tender gaze of your Father, unhindered by the discord of envy or the shadows of doubt. As you venture forth, Emboldened by the blessings showered upon you, may your heart find the wisdom to discern when to share and when to shield. 
May the silence be a garden where your blessings flourish, shielded from the storms of envy, doubt, and malice. And as you witness the grand tapestry of God's plan unfold, may your heart overflow with gratitude, your soul resonate with the melodious tune of divine wisdom, and your journey be a testimony of God's unfathomable love and grace.